But you know, if a thousand people decided they wanted to Now on these locks, this is one close to the uh, A1 so it's quite noisy, but on these locks you get these fantastic colonies of spiders. Look at them. I don't know how they organise themselves, I don't know when they work together or whether they compete for space, but they're really, really busy to grab this piece of real estate. There's a lot of kind of spider stuff going on here, and I don't quite know what it is, they're scrapping all the time or making love. They're all kind of working uh, at odds with each other, it seems to me. And they're socking great big spiders. Wow, look at you dudes. You could waste a lot of your life watching these guys fight it out. Well done spiders, good job. It's a real estate. saw that shape in that piece of wood, didn't they? Tell me now. Tell us we're the first boat ever to sail past you. Hang on, hang on a minute, Daddy. Hang on a minute. In five years, this is the first ever boat I've seen sailing with a sail up down the river Nick. Yay! Yay! Thanks Dad. You can go back to Dad now. Up there. A little blue dot in the distance my wife having a walk around while I'm having a sail.
as these rivers wind up and down, what you have to do is just run the outboard for a bit, uh, just to get you around the next bend. You know, you might only have to run the outboard for 20 seconds, and you can buy yourself another half an hour of sailing time. And that's what it's all about. There are times when I've enjoyed a little stretch of river so much that I'll turn around and motor back up it. It'll take me five minutes to motor up, and then if I'm lucky, I could make that drift back down again. Last me for 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Depends how fast you're going. But when it's slow, it's lovely. Sun is shining. Fifteen miles on up from Peterborough, the Nene, or the Nen as it is called in its upper reaches, passes through a wide fertile valley which is dominated by the Church of St Mary and All Saints, a name which suggests an organisation that is willing to hedge its bets. The church is ridiculously large and ostentatious for a parish of a mere 123 souls. And therein lies the story of a small village that ticks every box in the twisting, perfidious, murderous trail of events that have created the constitutional Britain we all know and love today. A thousand years ago, the whole area was in the hands of the Saxons. Then came the devout French thugs who were the Normans. At some point, it passed into the hands of the Scottish aristocracy when a widowed noblewoman called Maud married a bloke called David who unexpectedly became the King of Scotland. The fact that the Scottish owned a castle in the middle of England really stuck in the craw of the English. Eventually, Fotheringay fell into the hands of the Yorkists, a dynasty of ambitious homegrown British thugs. Later on, the notorious English King Richard III, you know, the one who had a bent spine, was subjected to a long character assassination by Shakespeare and was suspected of bumping off his own nephews, the princes in the tower. They were certainly in the way when it came to him becoming king, something he deeply wanted to be. He was the last English monarch to die in battle at Bosworth. A horse, a horse, you know the speech. Later on, Richard III became an essential part of Cockney rhyming slang. At one time, this was a Catholic church, but Henry VIII put a stop to all that and stole all the money and the gold and gilt, everything. So the weird thing about this church is... First of all, I mean, it's in an astonishing position. Its position is absolutely amazing. And then, the tower. You just don't see churches built that way. It's got flying buttresses. It's rather a squat church from the distance, and there's a reason for that, is that it used to be about two or three times as big. There's a lot of money being put into this place. This, this little village is of deep significance as far as 
England, Great Britain is concerned. It's a pretty shameful place for us Protestants because Mary, Queen of Scots, was put to death here. Elizabeth I, who was a hard-hearted, philandering virgin queen, had a troublesome, sensually saintly Catholic multi-married cousin Mary, Queen of Scots, incarcerated for 18 years, first in Sheffield and then for her final months at Fotheringay in the heart of Pope-denying East Anglia. She would have walked from here, her place of confinement, to the church almost every day. So she would have walked this path many, many times, wondering what the future held from the castle to the church. Queen Elizabeth eventually decided that Mary really had to go. She organised a complete sham of a trial on the back of some pretty shaky evidence. Mary's trial took place at Fotheringay Castle on the 14th and 15th of October 1586. Mary denied the charges and was spirited in her defence. She told her triers, Look to your consciences and remember that the theatre of the whole world is wider than the Kingdom of England. Yeah, we've forgotten that. She drew attention to the facts that she was denied the opportunity to review the evidence, that her papers had been removed from her, that she was denied access to legal counsel, and that as a foreign anointed queen she'd never been an English subject and thus could not be convicted of treason. After the evidence was heard, she was found guilty of treason on the 25th of October, 1586. Queen Elizabeth asked uh, Paulet, Mary's final custodian, if he would contrive a clandestine way to shorten the life of Mary and save her the trouble of having her executed, which he refused to do on the grounds that he would not make a shipwreck of my conscience or leave so great a blot on my poor posterity. It took Elizabeth a few months before she got around to signing the actual warrant, which she said happened by accident, as it was in a big pile of other stuff that needed signing that day. At Fotheringay on the evening of 7th of February 1587, Mary was told that she was to be executed the next morning. She spent the last hours of her life in prayer, distributing her belongings to her household and writing her will and a letter to the King of France. The scaffold that was erected in the Great Hall was two feet high and draped in black. It was reached by two or three steps and furnished with a block, a cushion for her to kneel on and three stalls for her, the Earls of Shrewsbury and Kent, who were there to witness the execution. The executioners, one named Bull and his assistant, knelt before her and asked forgiveness. She replied, I forgive you with all my heart for now. I hope you shall make an end of all my troubles. Her servants, Jane Kennedy and Elizabeth Curl and the executioners, helped Mary to remove her outer garments, revealing a velvet petticoat and a pair of sleeves in crimson brown, the liturgical colour of martyrdom in the Catholic Church. She was sticking with the politics right to the end. She was blindfolded by Kennedy and with a white veil embroidered in gold knelt down in the cushion in front of the block, on which she positioned her head and stretched out her arms. Her last words... In mansis tuas domine commendo spiritum meum. Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Mary sadly was not beheaded with a single stroke. The first blow missed her neck and struck the back of her head. The second blow severed the neck, except for a small bit of sinew which the executioner cut through using the axe. Afterwards, he held her head aloft and declared, God save the Queen. At that moment, the auburn tresses in his hand turned out to be a wig and the head fell to the ground, revealing that Mary had very short grey hair. See the moat. And so significant was this castle that after she was assassinated, they completely and utterly demolished it. The castle has now gone completely, reduced to nothing more than a lump by the river. Elizabeth was really keen to eradicate as much of her cousin's history as she could. 
There you have it, the English aristocracy. Always have been, always will be corrupt. What can I say? Is it running to the toilet? We've just spent the night here uh, on the edge of Peterborough, so we're then going to sail down to Peterborough and through back to the wash. Bear away, Jill. Turn out, turn away, turn away. Now you need to harden up a bit, otherwise we we'll, won't get around this bend. Is there? Well, there are limits. We've got to have a bit of river. Yeah, well, we've got to have a bit of river. Rubbish along the side of the Neem, but we are really, really whizzing along. Look at this, great. Super Rig is dealing with the pressure well. Good East Anglian sky though.
shopping spree. Wow, you can drop, dude. Look at you go.